What I'm going to do is give you kind of an overview of navigating the K-Award process um, at the NIH. And then um, the subsequent talk, Dr. Salewski's talk, is really going to get down into the details of how to write a competitive award. So, so my talk is more about the landscape, the rules, how to be strategic, and then he'll come behind me and really talk about the writing in the various sections, okay? So the first thing um, when you get onto the NIH website is there are a whole bunch of different career development awards, or CDAs. Um, and so the first step in the process is figuring out which award is the right fit for you. Um, so KO1s, these aren't all the K-awards, but these are the most frequent ones used by UCLA um, uh, faculty. The KO1s are for clinicians or PhDs in the field of epidemiology, outcomes research, and they must have accomplished independent research experience after earning their terminal degree. So what that means is you have to have a few publications before you apply for a KL1, and they should be in the field that you're applying to. So what's a few? Two or three with maybe another one submitted? Uh, that's really what a few is at most of the institutes. The K08 is salary and research support for full-time supervised career development in health-related fields that doesn't in involve patients. So this is different than clinical research, right? Because um, you're going to be doing research that um, doesn't involve touching patients. Many of our basic scientists and our lab-based scientists will go in for the KO8s. Um, the old K-12, that label is a little bit retired now, um, and the KL-2 supports awards to an institution to develop independent scientists. So in the CTSI, we have a KL-2. And what that means is NIH gives us a pot of money, and then we decide locally who the KL-2 awardees will be. So this is, this is the same as a K award at the NIH, but the difference is that we get the funds locally, we have a local um, uh, selection committee, we use the NIH criteria, we use the NIH forms, we make you use the NIH application, we represent the four institutions in the CTSI on the review panel, we try to make sure that every applicant has at least one reviewer from one of the other institutes. Um, and then we select the K awardees. The KL2 can only be for up to three years of support, whereas the um, KL1, KL8, and K23 can be up to five years of support. Um, the KL2 is awarded to the UCLA CTSI. The awards from the Institute are awarded to you personally. So when you think about your CV and getting your foot in the door at one of the Institutes, it's better for you professionally to have one of the Institute's K Awards rather than the KL2. It is considered more prestigious. So Mitchell Wong, who you're going to meet a little bit later, runs our KL2 program. And when we select people for the KL2, one of the first things we then do is we work with the individuals to see who would like to take their KL2 application, strengthen it, tune it up, and submit it to the NIH uh, as an individual K award. If you do that, you can get five years instead of three, and you've already gone through the process of preparing the application for us, so you're like 85% of the way there. And so we've been very successful at moving our successful KL2s off the award before the three years is up onto their individual awards so they can get five years of support. So, you know, as you think about your career, you can go either way. You could think about applying for the KL2 locally, or you could think about applying directly to the NIH. Now, ironically, we get so many applications for the KL2 locally, I think we had 61 art in our, in our last round for three slots, and then we were able to get three more institutional slots, so that's six out of 61. Whereas I'm going to show you numbers at NIH where if you submit and resubmit once, about 35% of the scientists nationally are funded. 
So uh, your odds are actually better at the NIH than they are at the KL2. But because the KL2 bar is so high, you pretty much have a really strong draft to send to the NIH if you apply to our program here in the CTSI. The other thing is, because we have so few of these awards, we will usually end up with 15 or 20 grants that are really good that we can't award. So we will um, contact you personally, and we will offer to work with you to tune it up to send it to NIH. So uh, I think Mitch will be talking to you about the case studios, which is a three-meeting plan over the course of about six months to help you have the strongest possible proposal when you do submit to the NIH. The K-23 is salary and research support for full-time supervised career development in patient-oriented research. And in this situation, you have to have finished your specialty training. So if you're an MD researcher, that means you have to be done with your cardiology fellowship or done with your pulmonary fellowship. Um, if you're you know, a public health researcher, then that doesn't apply so much. The K-25 supports career development of investigators with quantitative scientific and engineering backgrounds outside of biology or, or medicine. So, you know, we're getting a growing body of young people who are really interested in computational biology, um, in um, natural language processing approaches to electronic medical record data. Um, the K-25 could be a mechanism uh, to use for those types of um, scientific projects. The K-99 R00 is a bridging grant. So this is a relatively new uh, grant. And I, do we have uh, Dr. Evans coming today to talk? Not this time. OK. Sometimes Dr. Evans comes um, and, and gives a whole talk on the K99s. But we have a lot of expertise um, in how to get these. And we can show you successful ones uh, from here at UCLA. But what the K99 R00 does is it provides an opportunity for scientists to get one to two years of the mentor K phase, and then three years of independent work all rolled up in the same grant. Um, to qualify, you have to have a clinical or research doctorate and no more than four years of postdoctoral research training at the time of the application. So you see, all these different awards have all these little glitchy things about them in terms of eligibility. So the website there um, is the K kiosk, and it has the most up-to-date information about all of the different K awards. And so, you know, if you're eligible for more than one, and you're not sure which one you should really apply to, you can look online at the NIH on the K kiosk, and you can look at success rates for different awards. As one could imagine, the K-23s get a lot of applicants because physician scientists from all the academic medical centers tend to apply for those. You know, so if you're eligible for something that's not a K-23, it might be a less competitive um, mechanism to go after. Um, and then the other thing you can do, and we're going to talk about the project officers inside each of the institutes. Um, if you're really not sure and you're kind of on the fence, set up a 20-minute phone call with the project officer at one of the institutes you think your work would fit at and talk to them about it. Tell them about your background, tell them about your project, and, and see what they think in terms of which mechanism best fits for you. We're going to talk a little bit today about diversity supplements. So diversity supplements can be added to any already funded R award at the institution P award or U awards. Those are three types of awards that mid-level to senior scientists get. And as long as they have at least a year left on the award, they can apply for a diversity supplement. So who's eligible for diversity supplements? People who are eligible have to be underrepresented um, in uh, scientific disciplines. So underrepresented minorities, disabled persons, but also people from um, uh, low-income backgrounds, you know, so you could be um, a person who might have grown up in the San Joaquin Valley and you're the first person in your family to go to college. That would make you diversity supplement eligible. So the nice thing about diversity supplements is it's a short proposal. 
It doesn't go to study section. It receives administrative review at the institute. And most in institutes will review the diversity supplements like once a month. And so the turnaround on the feedback and resubmission is much faster. And it can support you for up to two years um, at 75 to 80,000, some of them are even $90,000 of salary support and benefits. So if you have a, a research area and a mentor here, where your mentor might have an R01, and you could add on a project that might expand the science but still you know, be on the same topic, that's really an ideal situation to go in on a diversity supplement. Another ideal situation is you might have um, a mentor or a lab you've been working in, it might be three specific games, and your mentor might submit for a diversity supplement for you saying, you know, Dr. So-and-so is going to do aim three and we're gonna use my big project as a mentoring experience to have her you know, work with the team, do AIM-3, get two years of support, publish a few papers, and then she's gonna be ready to write a K award. So a lot of times, the diversity supplement can be that bridge from being a postdoc to being a faculty member. I'll show you that diversity supplements, though, can actually be used at any level from high school all the way up to mid-faculty. So if you're a postdoc and you're underfunded, you might think about doing a diversity supplement if you're eligible um, to support yourself longer, if you need an extra year as a postdoc, or if you want to expand the scope of what you're doing. So um, this is from the NIH website, and it's kind of a, a life course trajectory of career adult, uh, development awards for individuals who have a health professional doctorate. I'll show you the same picture for PhDs because I know we have both in the audience. But uh, for the MD researchers, they start in medical school, they do a residency, some do subspecialty training, um, and then uh, this line is kind of like when you join the faculty. So what you can see is it's kind of blurry right here. So if you're a subspecialist and you know you're joining the faculty next year, you could apply to our KL2 program. Um, and you know, when you're kind of at this juncture, you can start thinking about applying for a KO8. Most of the K23s, the clinically oriented research or patient oriented research, happens to people after they finish their subspecialty training and they're already on a faculty. And then you can see these other awards. Now, you may apply for jobs and a place may tell you, well, we only look at applicants who already have a K award, okay? That's actually problematic because if you're coming from a postdoc, to get a K award, you have to prove that you have a job for the next five years. So you won't have a very competitive application if you write for a K23 and you say, I'll be on the job ne market next year and I'm gonna take this with me wherever I am. Because a lot of the success of the K Award, as you're going to hear from Dr. Salewski, is about your level of institutional support. You know, so is somebody providing you with lab space, or is somebody providing you with office space? Do you have infrastructure? Do you have a guarantee of a job for the length of the award? So it's very hard to write one of these and be competitive if you don't know where you're going to be working. And so we've tried to kind of educate places about that. I mean, if you know you really want to go to University of Chicago and that's what they told you, you know, talk to your mentor and that person can talk to the department and explain why it's going to be more competitive if you submit the K award once you're there than if you do it before you go in the job market. Now, what some people will do is they will have a job offer that they've accepted and in the offer, it will say, you know, we're very enthusiastic about you. We want to fully support you to submit a K award in your first year on the job here. Okay, with that kind of letter and with an, a, a strong letter of institutional support, if you had the K award application ready and you had identified mentors at the new place when you were in your job search process, you could submit that, say, you know, three or six months before you start in that job, if you wanted to. But I still think from being on study section that it's more competitive 
if you submit your first submission for a K after you've started your new job. Because, you know, things can fall apart. So, you know, if the study section's trying to decide how well supported you are and how stable the situation is, it's going to look more stable if you've already got the job, right? You're already started in it than to say in six months I'm going to be moving to Creighton University or wherever you're going to go. So here's the same picture for individuals with a research doctorate. Okay, so if you have a research doctorate, you start out in college, go to graduate school, you might do a postdoc, and then you become an independent investigator. So most of the awards here, again, are more for the young independent investigator. Like the K01, it kind of straddles this line. You might, if you, if you knew you were staying out at the same place, and, and you know, you, you had a commitment to lab space and you had a commitment to a job, you might apply for a K01 when you're like in your last year of your postdoc. But if you know that you're switching institutions, I might hold off until you get to the new place, okay? So before I go on, I wanted to just pause and ask if you have any questions about anything so far. Go ahead. Um, regarding the uh, requirements for 8.5 that somebody has a background outside, uh, oh. uh, regarding the requirement for a 8.5 that somebody has a background in some, you know, uh, non-medical related field uh, before they apply for it, would something like experimental psychology count? You know, I, I think it would, actually. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of our um, people from the Department of Psychology can apply for the K-23s. They can apply sometimes for the K-01s and sometimes for the k 25 So, So actually, that's a discipline where it's easy to make the case that it's patient-oriented or not, depending on the content of what you're doing. So those um, uh, departments where there's some delivery of patient services, but there also is a strong history of um, basic science, you can kind of go either way. So again, that's a situation where it's oftentimes helpful to have that conversation with the project officer and you know, talk to them about your content area, and they'll tell you where you're going to be most competitive. Other questions, or should we keep going? All right. Um, so, uh, timing about when to apply to the NIH, this is another picture they have on the website, not to beat a dead horse here, but some of you might be on F32's training grants, uh, a lot of postdocs around those, um, but this is kind of how the NIH thinks about the progression of all of these awards. And as I mentioned, diversity supplements can go from high school all the way through junior faculty. So what about time commitment and salary caps? We get a lot of questions about this. So to apply for a K award, it, you have to have 75% of your time protected to conduct research. And um, the only exception is for some of the surgeons and procedural specialties where if they're not in the OR, they're going to lose their skills. Um, you can be at 50%. So if you can make the case that you have a procedural specialty, um, that you need to be you know, doing that um, a, a certain amount of time to keep your skills up, you can make that case. Now the example that they give is for surgeons. I would bet if someone was an interventional cardiologist or some other kind of proceduralist that you could probably make the case that if you needed to drop down to 50%, it would be allowed. What about the salary cap? So for decades, um, K awards required 75% of your effort for $75,000 a year. So um, there's a little bit of a disconnect there between um, you know, what you need to be paid and um, how much protected time. So they have increased it a little bit uh, to 100000 for K 08s and K 23s. And some institutes have even gone a little bit higher than that. So the salary support also comes along with fringe. So you might know that in your current position, you have your salary, but then you have your benefits. And at UCLA, you know, the benefits can be 30%, sometimes 35%, um, if you have young children on your health plan. And so it's 100,000 plus benefits. So uh, when you think about this, the total support for you might be 130, 140,000. 
Um, and if you want to see details about this, what I've tried to do is I've tried to plug the um, notices on the NIH um, guide website for each of the things that I'm saying so that you can go look at the details beyond what we're talking about today. Um, there is some variability by institute on, on the exact amount for K awards. So for example, um, National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute um, increased their um, stipend to 100,000 quite recently, and you can read about it here. Um, so, you know, once you know what institute you're going to, you want to check their website and you want to see what their K is funded at. Now, you might be somebody who could go to more than one institute. So you might be able to take your proposal to NIA, or you might be at you know, National Institute on Aging. Or you might say, you know, because it's about older adults with cardiovascular disease, it also could go at National Institute for Heart, Lung, Blood. So in this situation, where your um, science straddles two institutes, that's where you really want to talk to the project officers. Because a lot of times, getting funded is all about your fit with their strategic plan and their research priorities. So, you know, NHLBI might have just gotten a big pot of money uh, to study aging and cardiovascular disease from Congress, and they need to find scientists for that. Now, this happened last year at the National Institute of Aging for Alzheimer's disease. Unanticipated, NIA got an extra $300 million for Alzheimer's disease last year, and it had to be spent in 12 months. And, and they heard about it in, like, July. You know, so what do they do when that happens? They call people like me who are center directors, and they're like, who do you know who's good at this and can, you know, get a proposal together fast? Because we don't want to have to give the money back to Congress. You know, Alzheimer's disease is this massive problem, but we didn't know that, you know, some lobbyist was going to push a bill through Congress and convince them to make this allocation this fast. So you, by talking to the project officers, a lot of times you can find out when, like, quirky things like that happen that might play to your advantage. So, you know, you might be a dementia researcher um, who has been at, you know, the Neurology Institute for years, and then you hear that National Institute on Aging all of a sudden has all this extra money for Alzheimer's disease, and you can pivot and use that same proposal and take it over to aging. And so you're not going to know those things unless you talk to people. So a lot of getting funded at NIH is all about relationship building and learning things that might not be on the K kiosk or might not be uh, an announcement in the NIH guide, though the Alzheimer's money was announced in the NIH guide. Um, so that's my next question for you as you're getting to learn the landscape. How many of you subscribe to the NIH guide? Yeah, very important to do. So after this meeting today, all of you are going to subscribe. So the NIH guide puts out a newsletter once a week on all funding opportunities. So even if you're a postdoc and you know you're not going to write an NIH grant for a few years from now, start reading them. You know, it's short. Just skim it. You, it helps you begin to understand which institutes do what. And, it, and once in a while, something will come out in a program announcement or a request for proposals that is, like, exactly in your area. And so you might decide, well, I wasn't really planning on writing that R grant for another year, but, you know, this announcement came out in such an outstanding fit that I'm going to kind of step on the gas and see if I can get a proposal together faster. And maybe I'm not as qualified as I would be a year from now, so I'm going to think about writing other people's coattails. So I'm going to get a senior scientist who's a mentor of mine on there to, you know, help a little bit so we can use his bibliography too or her bibliography too and, and put it together to make the proposal more competitive. So you kind of want to get used to this idea that you just sort of have your eye on the NIH guide and you're watching for things coming through. And, you, you know, it, it really does give you a sense of... Um, what the priorities and funding areas are. The other thing you want to do for the institutes that you feel like you might be going to, you want to read their strategic plan. It's on the website. 
Now, you know, a lot of strategic plans sort of are, you know, they look kind of like garbage or just platitudes or whatever. But look at the research content areas very specifically. And especially some of the plans will say, like, how many dollars a year that they allocate to various research areas. So, you know, if you can find an institute that's allocating a lot of money in your discipline, that's where you want to do the relationship building and that's where you want to become a known quantity. And we'll talk about how you get there. So what about additional salary support while you're on a career development award? So, okay, you know, you, you train for seven years, you live in Los Angeles where rents are astronomical, and, you know, the NIH is working in this fictitious world where they think for 75% of your effort they only have to pay $100,000, and so almost everybody has to have some secondary salary support, right? I mean, you've got to be able to make your hand financially here, and we're in a very high cost of living area. So, so one change that they made that's a big plus is during the last two years of a Mentored Career Development Award, you're permitted now to get concurrent salary support from any peer-reviewed grant from any federal agency. And there are specific criteria about how to do this, and, and uh, the details of those criteria are in here. But um, you, you can be a PI on a competing research project or the director of a sub-project on a multi-component grant. So some of you may have um, mentors or senior scientists you know who have um, grants like in the P-series, so a P-30 or a P-60. Those grants oftentimes have a couple of big sub-projects, two or three sub-projects, and each of those sub-projects could actually be like an R01 on its own, but they're clustered together under the P mechanism because there might be some efficiencies. So imagine if you know three projects all could be using the same data center, or you know three projects all could be using a special um, facility or technique for stem cell research. And so you know the, the point of the P60s is that there are cross-project synergies and there are cost efficiencies of putting these projects together. So, um, it, you know, you might get invited by a senior investigator to be one of those three projects. And that's a good thing. From our promotions committee, that's an R01 equivalent, so it's really good for you. Um, sometimes that's an easier way to get a big project than going out for the first time as an R awardee. Um, but, but I think that um, uh, it's nice that you're able to take some salary support doing that. A few years ago, you couldn't take it when you're on um, a K. You can also take salary support if your case active when the RP or U grant is submitted. So maybe you're in the third year of your K award and your mentor is submitting a P60, invites you to write a project, and then by the time you're in the fourth year, the, the P60 came through, so now you can take some extra salary support. Under those circumstances, you can reduce your effort on the K to 50%, but you still get to keep the whole $100,000. Okay, so this is pretty complicated, you know, when you're putting your whole salary together, and there are a lot more details, and there are a lot of people around who have kind of expertise about how to put these funding sources together uh, in a way that's by the books and legal and um, gives you, um, you know, the salary support that you need to continue on as a successful scientist. So what about leave policies? So life happens, right? Um, sometimes we might have a parent who's ill. Uh, we might have um, a difficult pregnancy. Um, we might have a child with a new diagnosis or a learning disability. And it's only going to be feasible to, for a couple of years, adjust the effort down to part time. OK, this happens a lot you know, in life, right? Um, and in the old days, if you were part time, you couldn't get you couldn't be funded on a K award. So if you had a K award, and say in year two, your mom had metastatic breast cancer, and you really wanted to move back to D.C. and do her hospice care, you would have to give up your K award. So there was a group of senior scientists, myself included, who worked for about a decade to get NIH to change that policy, and we were successful. 
And, and actually, Don Gannon up at UCSF um, was one of the big conveners, and um, I was the UCLA person, and there was somebody from Harvard, and it was actually Windsor Hooney was the head of the NIH when we uh, petitioned the director to do this. So there now is a policy that allows you to adjust the amount of time on your K award. So um, this is only to accommodate personal or family situations like parental leave, child care, elder care, your own personal medical problems that might happen or disability. It is not <laughs> to accommodate job opportunities because your chairman wants you to be in clinic three more days a week um, or you want to have a joint appointment. So those are not legitimate reasons for doing this. And, and the way it works is, um, you know, so NIH requires 75% effort on a K award. So let's say for a year you want to drop down to 50% total effort. So you have to go 0 0.5 times 0.75 of, so half of, 75% of your half time effort has to still be spent doing the science. So, so that's, that's how it works. This does not go back to study section. It goes to your project officer and the administrators at the institute to approve it. So that's really important because um, uh, it's fast. You know, sort of an urgent situation comes up, you can usually get this approval within a week or two if you have to. Um, so that's really important. One thing we really fought hard for that we didn't get um, was we wanted the awards to be lengthened. So let's say you have a five-year award, and for a year and a half you had to go half time because you had a sick child. Um, we wanted them to like add, you know, uh, a year and a half times uh, 0.5 onto the end of the award, and they weren't willing to do that. So they're not willing to stretch the duration of the award, but at least they're willing to let people keep the awards and be part time. So that was that was a really important big step, especially for um, uh, women faculty who disproportionately have these situations come up more nationally than men do at this point. So if you have to go part-time, you submit a written request, um, and it's considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So again, this is where the relationship building with the project officer, where you know the project officer knows you personally, has come to your national presentations when you presented work uh, you know, from your award, um, and because that person's gonna be making the case. You know, so if they've never met you, they've never heard about you, they, they still will make the case, but if they realize you're highly productive and you're doing really innovative science, they will make the case harder, right? And so um, uh, this is where it can really matter if you know someone. Um, you can't drop down to less than half time. So, uh, um, you know, and then you'll see the other details here. So Steve mentioned that some of us don't get funded on the first time. Some of us. All of us don't get funded on the first time sometimes, okay? so. Um, you want to know something about resubmissions. Um, so, uh, first of all, don't be disappointed if you don't get funded on the first time. You're actually in the majority of people in the country, okay? So, um, NIH and ARC, so ARC is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. It's where a lot of public health and health services researchers apply. Uh, will accept new applications following an unsuccessful resubmission. So this is a big change and it's really important. So the rules changed a few years ago where um, it used to be, you know, back in the previous century, that you could write a grant and you had two resubmissions. But what was happening was each resubmission is like nine months. So it was taking people two to three years to get funded. Um, and so NIH changed a policy that said everybody's only going to have one resubmission. And what their hope was, was that study section, if they saw small problems with the grant, they would fund it you know, knowing that somebody can't come back in, right? Well, it didn't work. And so uh, what happened was a lot of things that were close were dropping out and not eligible to be sent back in. So there was this policy change. And this policy change said if you were in that situation where you had resubmitted once and you just barely missed getting funded, uh, now you could take the same science and create a new application. Where, you know, before this policy, you had to have very little overlap with the next new grant, which obviously you might be working in a topic area for years, and you know, taking a left turn and developing a whole new area is not really very feasible. So, um, so, but 
NIH will not accept duplicate or highly overlapping applications for review at the same time. So you can't have a new application that's submitted before you get the summary statement uh, from the application that didn't get funded. Um, and you can't write a new application if a grant is in the pipeline and pending. So um, the other thing that's important is NIH will not accept a resubmission that's submitted later than 37 months after the receipt date of the initial renewal or revised application. Now, you know, sometimes we get a um, review and the review makes us angry. So it might make you angry because somebody brought up something where you actually addressed it in the proposal and they missed it. Now, so this happened to me um, almost two years ago. I submitted a proposal to the Minority Health Institute and it was for a pre-diabetes project that was a partner project with LA County to try to increase awareness around pre-diabetes and to try to get more patients aware that if they um, weren't going to do lifestyle that they could take metformin. And so um, we had a medical sociologist on the grant at 30% time. And the reason why the Institute didn't fund it was because one reviewer got really angry because we didn't have any medical sociologists on the proposal. So, you know, we're sitting there, right? how crazy is that, right? So, so we, you know, we wrote to the Institute and the project officer and said, you know, this is bad review. They missed it. It's in four places in the grant. The guy's on the budget, you know? So they, at council, they considered whether to fund us or not, and then they decided not to. So, so sometimes things just, life is unfair, right? And, and it can be unfair when you're a senior scientist, a junior scientist. Luckily, you know, those things don't happen a lot. But, but sometimes there's something, you know, if you get kind of an offer, uh, just a ridiculous review, you know, the stomach to pull it out and revise it right away and send it back in, like sometimes you just don't want to. You just don't want to deal with it. It makes you angry. And what I'm going to tell you to do is, like, put it in a drawer for a week. And then make yourself read it. Because study sections turn over. Okay, most people serve a three-year term. So if that grant's going to go back to the same group. And if you wait too long, it's going to be a whole new cast of characters. And they might find different problems wrong with your grant. So it's really advantageous to do your revise and resubmits fast. Like try to get in for the next cycle because most of the people in the room will be the same people. And if you do a really good job, they'll go, wow, she was highly responsive to our concerns last time. They're gonna be more predisposed to, to fund you. Okay, so the other thing is like, sometimes when you're responding, especially when the comments are stupid or off, um, it, it's, you sound angry, you know? So one of the things you can do for each other or your mentor can do for you is before you turn anything back in, have somebody who's not angry read your um, response and clean it up. And that, you know, graciously thanks the study section for, um, you know, these insightful comments and, uh, you know, makes it nice. So why do you want to do that? Because if you get angry, they get angry back. Because you have to think about who is study section. Study section is a bunch of people like you a few years older. So they're mainly university professors. They're usually, you know, associate professors or higher, though there are some assistant professors at study section. I personally wouldn't advise spending your time. Um, but, but, you know, when you serve on study section, it's a three-year term. Three or four times a year, you have to go to the FESDA at NIH. They put you up in a really crummy hotel. Um, and you're in a room with no windows, usually a conference room at that hotel for like two days. And before you go, you have like five or six proposals that you're the primary reviewer on that you have to read. And you are a volunteer. Okay? So especially the West Coast reviewers, it, every one of those study sections, it's like a four-day deal, you know, to go. So these people are volunteers. They do it because they care about the integrity of the science. 
The NIH does give you a stipend when you're a reviewer, but not for the time before you get there and not for the travel time. And the maximum amount of the NIH stipend when you're a reviewer is $200 a day, okay? So now when I, you know, when my children were little and I was an associate professor and I would go off to study section, I would have $1,200 of extra childcare costs the week that I would go to study section, right? Because the nanny would have to stay late because I was getting on an airplane and, you know, making it all work, right? So if somebody has volunteered at that level and they've really tried hard to help you and then you come back and you're angry or snotty with them, like, do you think they want to fund you? You know, so, so you really do have to play nice. I mean, even if it's a really off review, you know, you're just, you know, think about the goal, not about your immediate feelings, and you're not going to get to goal unless it's very professional, very polite, and, you know, very much grounded in your field, how you respond. And so, you know, you're going to need to get others to help you, uh, to make it sound good and, and to sound sincere. Uh, because if you can't do that on a resubmission, you know, it's very unlikely that you'll get funded. So um, you're going to need help the first few times you do this. Sometimes people have um, brought their K award reviews to this workshop. So uh, there was one um, person, and I won't name her because she was at the June workshop uh, last year, um, who had submitted a K award to the National Center of Aging. She had gotten comments back. Like 70, 80 percent of the comments were good. A few of them were a little bit off, but there actually were some pretty major flaws with her project that she didn't really appreciate. And so, uh, you know, we did an afternoon workshop and I was one of her reviewers and Dr. Duru was one of her reviewers. And we, we gave her a pretty long laundry list of things we thought she had to fix before sending it back in. And, you know, she was gracious and she thanked us, but I could tell she was a little irritated. And, you know, then she went and she met with her mentor and they spent two months, like, changing it up. And she resubmitted to NIA and in January she got a perfect score. So, um, you know, we've had now three perfect scores out of the K Award reviews. So, you know, sometimes it's hard to hear criticism, right? Well, she hasn't heard if she's funded yet. We're still waiting. They scored the grant in February, so uh, she should hear any day. Um, but, but yeah, you know, that can happen if you're, if you're, you know, willing to listen and willing to work hard um, to improve your proposal. So, you know, she went from an unfundable 35 to a perfect score in one cycle. So, get advice and help when you're responding to comments. She brought the comments and her proposal because she was really kind of like, ah, what do I do with this? You know, I mean, it was just, it, I think she knew how much work it was going to be to fix it. It was really hard to fix, which I can completely appreciate. So, okay, so, so what about all the acronyms? One, one of the hard things with um, uh, getting used to being on the NIH website is figuring out what everything stands for, right? The government loves acronyms. So obviously NIH is National Institute of Health. Uh, ARC is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, the current Congress, it sounds like, is going to shove ARC into NIH. Right now it's not part of NIH. Um, and so there is a budget floating around. In the president's budget, they move ARC into the NIH and they zero out the budget. The Congress puts ARC into the NIH and cuts the budget by about 30%. So um, I'm not sure where ARC's going to exactly end up. I think it would be really, really unlikely that ARC doesn't exist but I think that it probably will be a smaller institute than it is as a freestanding agency right now. And we really don't know how that's going to be in terms of cutting the pie, in terms of extramural support. So we'll find out. It is a work in progress. Um, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute is a public-private partnership that sits outside the NIH. It was formed by the Affordable Care Act. Um, and it sunsets in 2019 if it doesn't get re -upped. By Congress. Now, the thing about PCORI is it doesn't cost the government any money. PCORI is paid for by a 1% tax on health insurance. And so the health insurance companies actually pay for PCORI. Um, so, you know, it's not going to help the congressional budget. And the health insurance plans like PCORI because through the large pragmatic trials and other clinical research, comparative effectiveness research that's done at PCORI, Oftentimes, health plans can decide on coverage decisions. 
And so they would rather have an evidence base for deciding that an MRI is not necessary for that person with musculoskeletal back pain than to re rely solely on sort of expert opinion, right? So, so the kind of research that PCORI does is really about quality of care, appropriateness of care, um, comparative effectiveness. So when there are two strategies, um, I know one person who had a PCORI grant who uh, was looking at dual versus single chamber pacing uh, for heart failure, you know, so comparing two technologies, comparing two medications, comparing a behavioral approach to a pharmaceutical approach to treat a problem. Those are the kind of things that fall under PCORI, and you can learn um, more about them. Now, ARC does PCORI's um, reviews. So um, a, a lot of the review infrastructure for P PCORI now actually sits at ARC. So again, if ARC gets subsumed in NIH, I assume the PCORI reviews come with them, but we don't know at this point. So some people in the field of public health and health services have come to me and said, you know, since it looks like ARC might be on the ropes, should I really apply there? And, and my feeling is, and my feeling has been for the last 20 years, that if you have a project that fits under the big umbrella of the NIH, so if you could go to Maternal Child Health Institute or go to ARC, I would say always go to the NIH. And the reason why is NIH historically has had very strong bipartisan support. And, and uh, you know, Congress, even in the lean years, sometimes NIH doesn't get increases, so that's a de facto decrease because of inflation, but they rarely have gotten like huge draconian cuts. And so, um, whereas ARC has been, you know, politically a little more on the fringe, and it's, it's a little bit more in the crosshairs in terms of budget cuts. So, um, I would say if, if something fits at NIH, I would always go to NIH first. Um, you will see these acronyms in the NIH guide. You really like the ones that start with R, requests for applications and requests for proposals. These are for cooperative agreements. I'll explain to you what the difference between a cooperative agreement and a grant is. These are for grants. But the important thing about RFAs and RFPs is what that means is the money has been set aside for that topic. And when you read the RFA, you'll see that they'll say, you know, we have six million dollars to study spinal cord injuries and we plan to fund 12 grants. Okay, now if you work in spinal cord injuries, if they don't spend that money for that, they have to give it back to Congress. They can't spend it for anything else. Okay, so that's great. I mean, those are the, those are the, you know, requests for proposals. If you have one of those in your field, you want to look for those and do them. RFPs are for cooperative agreements. What cooperative agreements are is a type of grant where you collaborate and partner with some of the scientists inside the institute. And um, the, the cooperative agreement mechanism is something actually that the Centers for Disease Control use a lot because they have a lot of really strong scientists on the inside. And so um, these uh, cooperative agreements are much more partnered. So you don't have complete free reign of what you do. You know, if you get a grant, you're pretty much in charge of the science. And if you want to change the science, it's a good idea to talk to your project officer about it and explain why, but actually by law you're not required to. So, um, you know, I still strongly encourage it, but, you know, our, our phase for um, independent research grants are, are give you the most flexibility and autonomy. RFPs are going to be cooperative agreements. I mean, I've been continuously funded on cooperative agreements since 1998. It's a fantastic mechanism, and it really has added a lot of scientists from other parts of the country to my proposals and, and uh, science, and it's been really fun. So um, even though, you know, you've got to do a little brokering and a little constraints here, a lot of times you'll get a high-level statistician from the institute or um, a population scientist, in my case, um, that, you know, you don't have to pay for. And, uh, you know, they can enhance the science a lot and you become, you know, good lifetime collaborators. PAs or program announcements are basically unfunded mandates. Okay, now that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to fit your science under a PA if there isn't an RFA. Because, you know, if you fit under a PA, at least you're showing that you're in the content area that the institute says they care about. So, so there are a couple of PAs types. 
If you've read the Institute Strategic Plan, there might be a PA that relates quite tightly to the strategic plan. If you go to the National Diabetes uh, NIDDK Institute, right now in their strategic plan, they have a lot of um, uh, verbiage about reducing obesity in the country, okay? And they have program announcements about reducing obesity and different types of science to try to help make that happen. So those are program announcements that they hope will attract good proposals and that they will fund. There's that nice linkage. Sometimes institutes will put a program announcement out there just to appease Congress. You know, so they go to Congress, they, the, the directors of the institutes have to report every year on their portfolio, and then the congressional people decide how much money to give NIH and how much to go to each institute, okay? Now, who influences how Congress does that allocation? Any ideas? Lobbyists do, right? And so you'll notice some diseases, if you start really reading the NIH guide, some diseases seem to get disproportionate attention for their public health impact, right? And so why does that happen? Well, some conditions have really effective, strong lobbyists, you know? The Christopher Reeves Foundation, you know, really got spinal cord injury on the map and got a lot of money allocated to that, and they did that through very highly effective lobbying of Congress. Um, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, uh, the uh, upper middle class white gay males organized themselves and got Congress to understand early on how much money they needed to allocate to HIV. So, you know, the lobbying can be a good thing or it can distort the portfolio a lot. But I think what you want to know is if there's a program announcement in the area, how much does the institute really want to fund? And the way you find that out, they're not going to tell you in an email, and they're not going to tell you in writing in the NIH guide, you're going to have to talk to someone. And, and when you talk to the program officer at the institute, you can get a sense of how important having proposals come in under a certain PA is. Also, the project officer at the institute can tell you if they got, you know, 50 times more than they can fund in that area in the last cycle, or whether they didn't get any and they really need one. You know, and you just happen to be a scientist who works in that area. So again, the, you know, the conversations, what these project officers will say to you on the phone, they would never put in writing, okay? So how do you approach the NIH? So we've got, you know, the U.S. government here at the top, and Congress appropriates funds. NIH allocates the funds to the institutes, and Congress influences, you know, like there are things like the Cures Act that's increasing NCI's funding a lot. You know, so there's some congressional influence on the allocation decisions. Uh, and then the institutes have their pot of money. And they spend some of their money on institute-initiated grants, and then there are investigator-initiated grants. So you could go in and not be under a program announcement. You might just have a brilliant idea that you really want to fund. And so there's no law telling you that you can't go in with your own big idea, even if it doesn't fit into their portfolio, but it better be a really outstanding big idea because it's really hard to get funded if you don't fit in the portfolio, even remotely. You want to kind of build the case, right? So, I've said this a lot in this talk already, but I can't say it too much. Establish relationships with the program officers in your research area. For career development awards, almost every institute has one program officer who does all the training awards. And these tend to be the people who like young people. They like developing people, they like giving you advice, they like helping you. I've only in my whole career run into like one program officer who somehow ended up in that K position and like wasn't helpful and didn't like people, but the vast majority of them do. Okay, so, um, so you know, you want to meet that person and, and it's more than just meeting them, you know. So, so when you have a K award, let's say you're going to be giving a talk at the American Heart Association meeting, right? Send your slides and invite your project officer to come to your talk. It's a big meeting. They might miss that you were on the program, right? They love that. They love seeing the young people in their portfolio 
do their science and see their institute acknowledged. You know, when you submit an interesting paper, send a locked PDF to your project officer and just say, you know, this is the first publication from the grant. You know, I'm so grateful for the advocacy you did for me. I wanted you to see the science. I wanted you to be one of the first people to see the science. You know, so if you have that relationship, you know, honestly, if you send your papers in and invite them to your presentations, you will be one of 10% of all awardees in the country who do that. I do not understand why people don't do this because it really, really makes a difference. Then when a new RFA comes out in your area, they'll be worried you might have missed it in the NIH guide and they'll send it to you. Say, hey, this is one that you might be interested in. You know, so you start that relationship. You know, Robin Barr was the um, K Award person at NIA back when I got my K Award in the previous century, right? And so I met Robin on the phone and, you know, he was always extremely helpful and very professional and I actually had a phone relationship with him for about a decade before I ever saw him in person. And, and um, you know, so I finished my K award and in a few years I was a mentor on other people's K awards and he was still there, right? So I actually transitioned from being an awardee to a mentor in his portfolio. And then one of my UCLA mentees was presenting their K23 at the Beeson meeting and I sat down and I was watching the presentation and I see the badge on the person next to me is Robin Barr. And like we saw each other for the first time and we realized it had been like almost 17 years that we had had this, you know, really great, mutually beneficial, professional relationship. And, you know, it was kind of disappointing because I had this idea of what he looked like and I think he had an idea of what I looked like and, you know, we both blew that. But, but um, you know, but it was really, you know, I think I can't tell you enough how important it is to put a human face on it. You know, I think with Twitter and email, and you know, it's, it's very easy to think, oh, I, you know, I don't have to schedule that phone appointment. Now, when you schedule the phone appointment, you don't want to waste these people's time. They get boatloads of emails. So what you want to do, you know, you might have a grant and you're, you're trying to decide, is it a good fit at the Institute? You're trying to decide, does it fit in this RFA? So you want to do the one pager. You know how you have one page for your specific games? You may not know it yet, but you'll know it after Dr. Salusky's talk. Um, and so what you want to do is draft your aims. Go one or two rounds with your um, mentor. Make sure, you know, they're kind of good, but still a little bit rough. And then email who you think should be the project officer. You know, so it, if, it's a, if it's an RFA, it says at the bottom who's the scientific officer, so you can see it in the announcement. If it's a K award, you'll be able to see online who does the K awards at that institute. So you email, you introduce yourself, you attach the rough draft of the idea, and you ask if you could have a 20-minute phone call just to pitch the idea, see how it's going to fit the best at the Institute or if it's a fit at all. If you're trying to decide between two institutes, you can say that in the email. I'm trying to decide if this fits at NCI or if it's better at the Neurology Institute. You know, and, and, and they, you know, you want to set the agenda, you want to set the time and you want to stay on message and be efficient and and if you do that like you stand out so much compared to everybody else in the country and they will remember you so you know these small things you know they don't make a difference if you write a disastrously weak pr proposal but if you're like right on the cusp that's where these things I've seen make a difference because, you know, if somebody knows that you're, a, when you're a study section, if a project officer knows that this is a really good person who always delivers, you know, I've seen her present at a national meeting, um, you know, she gets the job done, she publishes the papers, then, you know, if they're right on the edge, they're more likely to give you the grant. So the relationship building matters, the face time matters. Those people go into those jobs because they care about all of you and they care about science. So, you know, you gotta give them a little love back, right? Um, so, in terms of the NIH, there are two parts. We've been talking a lot about the institutes, that's where the programs are. But the reviews actually happen for the, in the Center for Scientific Review. So, um, you can go look at CSR and their website. There's supposed to be a firewall between these two. So the people who score the grant and who go find people like me to serve on study section, 
are separate from the program. But the program people recommend people for the scientific review. And then also they're allowed to, the program officers sit in the room, but they don't talk. So they watch the reviews and they hear what's happening. Okay. A lot of times things that might not be written in the review that's a problem with your grant, if you have a relationship with the program officer and you call them after the study section and you've gotten your reviews, you want to discuss them, they'll tell you things they heard in the room that didn't hit the page on the paper. And so it's really important to debrief on your reviews with the person who was in the room. Um, but they, they don't talk, trust me. I've been there and they just sit there and watch. Okay, so um, the review process takes about eight to nine months. Initially, there's an administrative review. If you forgot to use Arial 11 point font, stops here. You lost a cycle. Okay? If you don't if you had the wrong page limits, you're done. You have to wait a cycle. So, follow the directions. Make sure that you've got all required tables. Make sure that you follow the structure. Um, make sure that it uploaded correctly. Okay? Now, I would say the most important thing is to don't be at the last minute. Because sometimes Things don't go well. Okay, so uh, the last cycle in June, um, the interface that NIH uses, it's called Cayuse. Did some of you end up caught in this? Yeah. So um, on the very last day that proposals were due at 4.10 Pacific time, Cayuse went down. And so um, I think Department of Medicine was submitting 27 proposals that day. And luckily, they had gotten all theirs in early in the day. OCGA had 13 proposals they couldn't submit, the Office of Grants and Contracts at UCLA. So um, they called NIH and said, Caius is down, what are we going to do? And they said, mm, they're an independent vendor. Those aren't submitted. So those people had to wait a cycle. So don't be on the last day. You know, I, I have a P30, a competitive renewal going in today. Um, it's due on July 20th, you know. So it has four cores. It's almost 400 pages long. And so if we gave it to the grants and contracts folks for, with 48 hours, odds are it would not get submitted correctly. You know, I will get a litany in the next seven days of error messages and questions. And there's this iterative process where, okay, it's finally submitted. You better allow a week for that process. Trust me. I've seen enough times when, you know, things have not gone well um, because of problems with submitting at the last minute. Also, when you review a grant, you can tell if someone submitted it at the last minute. It's got spelling errors. It's got typos. It has formatting problems. It's usually wall-to-wall -wall words. You can tell they didn't have time to edit it. And so that all affects your score. So be ahead of the game enough so that your figures are pretty, that you can break up the text a little bit, that you have time to actually edit. You know, now in the shorter format that we have, you know, we have 12 pages, we, you know, some of us can only think in 25 page single space ideas because that's what we did for decades and now all of a sudden we have to do 12. It's really, really hard to do 12. I think the shorter format, it's great for those of us who serve on study section. It's very hard for the junior reviewer, or for the junior investigator to be competitive. Because there's kind of like this assumption, if you didn't put it on the paper, you don't know it. But now you have less space. So the person with like the extraordinarily good batting record, they go, oh yeah, he knows that. You know? But if you're a new investigator trying to prove yourself, got the shorter format, you've got less space, so you've got to be really good at getting your message out. You know, and, and if you're not a strong writer, then you need to hire someone to help you. You know, there, there are at RAND, there are these communication specialists who will read grants and make them more concise. They cost about $900 a day to hire. Uh, I'm division chief in general medicine for one of my junior faculty who submitted a K award last week, uh, revise and resubmit. Um, I paid for one of the communication specialists at RAND to work with him for three days. Because he's brilliant, but like he doesn't know how to say his science in a way where an average smart person can understand what he's saying. You know, and so you gotta understand, like people in study section, they're not exactly in your field. But they're all like average smart people, 
right? I mean, they're university professors, they are researchers, they had their own grants, you know? But, but you have to be able to tell your narrative and your story in a way that, um, you know, it could be understood by an average smart person who's not in your field. And so, for some people, like, that's a natural, they can just, like, go do that. For other people, it's a real struggle to get there. They can't see what parts are gonna throw everybody else. Okay, so if you, you know, if you know you're a person with that problem or you find writing challenging, address it. You know, don't just sit there and struggle with it. Talk to your mentor. There are, you know, there's resources through CTSI. There are resources uh, that you can hire to help you get to the beautiful grant. But you can't get to the beautiful grant if you finish it 24 hours before it's due, okay? Most applications, as we said, aren't funded on the first round. So um, this is kind of how the flow goes. You know, you turn in your application and you go, you know, get yourself a glass of wine or something because you made it. And then um, CSR assigns it to a study section and they assign it to an institute. Now, for the institute, you can steer it with your cover letter. So you can say, you know, I talked to Dr. Robin Barr at NIA and he feels like this proposal is a really great fit for NIA. So my preference would be that it goes there. Now imagine this like poor person. Now this person probably has a computer who has to sort all the proposals and put them in the right piles. If you help them get your grant in the right pile by steering it with the cover letter, their job's easier. So it always put the institute you would like it to go to. If you want to have dual assignment, so, you know, you did your homework, you talked to the project officer at NHLBI, you talked to the project officer at Maternal Child Health, they both would like it. You can ask that, that once it's scored by CSR, that it's sent to both institutes. So you, you can do that if you, if you want to. They don't have to listen to you, but if you put the names of the project officers in, and then the other thing you want to do is when you submitted the grant, you make a lot of PDF, and you send a thank you note to that project officer who had that 20 minute call. And you tell them, you know, thank you Dr. Barr, I just wanted to let you know that your, your suggestions were really helpful and the grant went in today and I thought you might want to have a copy. And you do that because then the institute can request that you're put in their pile. Okay, so you don't want to end up in the wrong pile. And so you gotta like, you know, do the things that you can legally do to steer it a little, okay? So then the study section gives you a one to nine score. And uh, the institute uses those, uh, one's the best, nine's the worst. The institute uses those priority scores and they rank the applications. Mm -hmm. Then the pile goes to something called advisory council. Advisory council are senior scientists in the field. Uh, it's a huge honor to be invited to be on advisory council. And they sit in the room, they look at the pile, and then, and they look at the institute's priorities and they decide what to fund until their money runs out. Now, they're not <coughs> bound to go in exact numeric order. <coughs> what if the five highest scoring grants all are in exactly the same field? They have to worry about the whole priorities and portfolio. So they can skip grants and go further down in the pile to meet programmatic needs, right? So, it, you know, don't, you know, you may have, Sometimes people have a very high scoring grant and they're devastated because they weren't funded, but it might be that you're just in a really competitive field. Um, so this is a slide showing you the scoring system. But there's a real, uh, you know, and NIH really wants everybody to use the full scale, but nobody at study section does. Um, so pretty much grants historically above 30 to 35, oh, and then they multiply this number by 10 for some reason. So, so grants of 30 to 35 are, you know, might get funded. Grants in the 20s usually get funded. Grants in the teens almost always get funded, though not always. Um, and so people are really using the high end of the scale a lot. Um, there was an announcement that came out of NIH this week that I didn't have time to um, add to my talk, but there is a new effort to try to get more young investigators. And they're calling young investigators people who are 10 years from their terminal research degree. And they basically said that they want to set the percentile at about the 25th percentile for that group. And they explicitly said in the announcement that grants of 35 and up, they're gonna try really hard to fund. So that is a much better bar 
than what you currently have today. I'm not sure how fast they're going to implement that policy, but it was in um, kind of the NIH blog two days ago, and I haven't had a chance because of that P30 to um, read the actual policy yet, but I would, I would recommend that you go look at it. Um, so I am going to wrap this up so you don't lose your break and so Dr. Saluski can start on time, but I'm going to just give you a few um, tidbits. He's going to hit this stuff much harder, but you have it um, on my slides to look at too. So these are the sections of the grant. You have a section called Significance, and, and Dr. Saluski will tell you how to make that uh, part sing. Um, your approach. Uh, is very important. This is, you know, we used to call this the methods. Now it's called the approach, but it's basically where your methods are. <laughs> and so this is where you really say, you know, um, what you're going to be doing. They have a new thing that you have to address. And, you know, when they say you have to address, use their words, okay? Because study section is going to go, okay, you know, there's this new criteria called scientific rigor. Where is it in here? So make it easy. You know, remember, that West Coast reviewer is jumping on the red eye at 10 at night after feeding her children, and now she opens up the PDFs and she's got to read five grants before she touches down at Dulles in six hours, right? So make her job easy. Make the grant pleasant to read. Make it easy for her to find the required elements. Your score will go up, I promise you. I've been in that seat on that plane many times, okay? Um, so transparency, it's rigor and transparency. And so um, the other thing that is uh, important is, you know, the scientific premise. So you may have some key data, maybe from your K award for your first R award. So you've got some results from the K that really justify the project. You know, make that daisy chain connection for them. Um, the scientific rigor part is um, strict application of the scientific method. Think a lot about how to make your experimental design as unbiased as possible. Um, and you know, there, there are specific review criteria now that we all have to use to judge you on these new areas. So have a bold header. Let, let the reviewer know exactly where it is. Um, and then there are some other considerations that you can read about. Uh, we all have to talk about innovation. You know, do you have novel concepts, novel methods? Something that comes up with innovation in my field is sometimes you could take an established intervention and apply it to a new population. And so, you know, there might be a therapy that's been shown to work really well in white upper middle class people, but it's never been tested in low income people. And so that might be an innovation to actually take something established and apply it to a new population. Um, or it might just be a brand new concept. Um, and then they're going to you know, be judging you. And uh, Isidro will tell you how to talk about you. They're going to judge your environment. You guys are really lucky. You're at UCLA. We have an extraordinary environment here for research. Uh, we also have a lot of boilerplate on the CTSI website, so like if you need to describe the resources that are available to you as a young investigator. There's a whole section of the website that you can cut and paste those descriptions from. Uh, budget matters. Budget has to link to science. The, the biggest mistake early investigators make is you guys promise too much for the budget. And so it's got to be feasible and realistic. And so a senior investigator will really help you titrate down what you want to do to actually match the resources available. Um, and then, you know, I will, I'm going to show you a couple of histograms here. Um, these are from the NIH website, and you can look at them. These are career development award trends um, uh, from uh, 2006 to 2015. And even though, you know, we had um, a little bit of a dip there in 2013, things are kind of on the up and up right now. Um, if we, you know, think about these awards and success rates, I always like, um, I'm going to show you a series of slides, they're all laid out the same. This is 2011, the next one's 2012, 13, 14, 15, so we're sort of looking for linear trends here. So what I want you to do is I want you to pay attention, we'll pick one row, let's pick the K23. Um, number of applicants reviewed, number awarded, success rate 33.9, okay? 
uh, total funding at NIH, $31 million. So, you know, this talk today may have depressed you, but for all of you in the room, since you were in kindergarten, when weren't you in the upper tercile? I mean, honestly, you know, look in the mirror, know who you are. You are always in the upper tercile. This is not a reach that you can't get to, okay? It's formulaic. And, you know, why do we have the CTSI? Why do we have the investigator development? So we can teach you the formula, okay? So how, how are we doing over time? So there it was 33.9. What happened in 2012? 36.6. There's a little dip in 2013. 32% got funded. 2014, we're almost to 40% going two rounds getting funded. And then in 2015, we're back down at 35%. So um, success rates and pay lines vary a little bit by institute. So again, you know, look up your institute, see you know, how the numbers look. If you have a choice between two institutes, you know, pick one with a higher success rate. Um, and I will stop there.